So I want to shift gears a little bit from yesterday when we were talking about all these different types of disturbances. And, and I want to start moving to where we're going with these scenarios this afternoon uh, or later this morning uh, in, in terms of now what? Now what is the recovery? Because we're living with disturbance. And as we talked about yesterday, there's been major disturbances and they're constantly going on. So I want to introduce another component to this. Yesterday, we were really talking about the physical and biological processes. So this title here, when you start delving in to the dictionaries, disaster always has a social component, where catastrophe doesn't necessarily have any social component. So we talk about catastrophic disturbances, and we talk about things that are disasters. So that, that's sort of the separation I want to be doing here today. So we're going to be looking at disturbance both through an ecological lens and a sociological lens. So there's an ecological impact, but there's also an economic impact, and, a, and, and we'll be talking about other sociological impacts as well. So I'm going to focus at, at times, bring it down to uh, just the ecological component, I mean, the economic component of people, uh, but we will be comparing the specific focus on both ecological recovery and financial recovery, because they're, they're actually quite different. And often when we get a room of ecologists and managers and planners, we're, we're using variables in different ways because of the lens that we're looking through at the at problem. So let me give you an example of this. The GCH, probably none of you in this room have ever heard of GCH. It's the great colonial hurricane of 1635 which struck northeastern uh, United States, primarily the colony of Boston. It is, in every sense of the word, a catastrophic disturbance. Blew down very large areas. We have early reports from the governor of the Boston colony and the governor of the Providence colony talking about the details of what happened. The best estimates from those writings is the storm surge was over six meters. And the peak winds at landfall are estimated by the records of the trees that were breaking down to be over 200 kilometers per hour. You haven't heard much about it because there weren't many people around to talk about it. So let's jump ahead. Hurricane Sandy hit just to the south of the GCH in 2012. It was disastrous. 15,000 homes destroyed. Huge financial impact. The storm surge was less than three meters, but since it flooded the New York City subway, it, it brought a giant city to its knees. Peak winds were only 130 kilometers per hour. Hurricane Sandy was, by every sense of the word, a disaster. But the GCH, as far as we can tell from these records, there was no loss of life uh, in the GCH. Uh, and, and very few structures to blow down. So this is what I'm getting at, the difference between a disturbance and a catastrophe. And we're, when we're talking about a recovery from a disturbance, there are the social component and the ecological component. So whenever we're looking at objectives of our silviculture in particular, you always have to separate. Is biology your objective or is biology the constraint in terms of where you're trying to go? Let me give you a couple examples on that. In natural selection, success is that your gene alleles make it into the future. That is the only measure of biological success. It doesn't matter how big you are if you're a tree, how big in diameter you are. If the gene alleles of that tree make it into the future, it's a success. So let me ask, I, I know there's some from yesterday. How many in this room are a grandparent? There we are. You are the big success stories in this room. From, from an, a natural selection process, you have made it. The rest of us, it doesn't matter how much money you make, how many books you've written, um, how many political offices you've made, you, you can't stack up against these guys. Uh, they are success. However, when we start looking, are we looking as biology being the objective or biology being the constraint that makes a big difference when you're considering the rate of recovery. Because as we look at this, well, OK, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. But think about this in terms of, of the ecology. There is no time component. T 
time is a people component. So we're going to be touching on that. Now, before we get into that, I want to bring up a different subject because we often, we, we have a very human lens that we look at recovery. And that is you don't always go back to the same state in nature. There's multiple stable states, multiple equilibria of, of, of steady states. So uh, let me give you an example. Again, from the east, sorry, I spent most of my time there. The Pisgah Tract, which is a heavily studied area in southern New Hampshire. And here we've used very detailed stand reconstruction. Cut down all the trees, disking, get not only the height growth, but out all the major branches, getting branch growth. Going through the forest soil very carefully, looking at all remnants of dead wood, because bark is incredibly inert. You can identify trees and mixed species stands by their bark, and by carefully going down through the soil, we call this forensic silviculture, you, you can find, you know, if this bark is on top of that bark, then this tree died first and this tree went down. So you can actually construct fruit, and then you combine this with some historic human records, and you can put it through your history. So it's a very small, it's, a, it, it's about 18 hectare, but we know more about those 18 hectare than probably any place in North America. So what do we know? We know, we, we, we were able to date back, no, I, I say we, that's humans, I had nothing to do with this, that humans now know that there was a hurricane 300 years earlier that had blown down the stand and we think that's how it began. And we know after that hurricane, it became a mixed hardwood stand. Then there was another hurricane. And you remember yesterday when I was talking about the resistance of stands and the magnitude of disturbance. In northeast United States, a catastrophic hurricane is about once every 100 years. There's hurricanes much more frequently than that, but they're not catastrophic because the trees aren't big enough to blow down because they're coming from the last hurricane. So we know that the next hurricane was followed by a hot fire from all the wood that was on the ground. And lo and behold, it became a pine stand. Then we know there was another hurricane, and this time there was no hot fire. This is the hurricane in 1938, so we, we had fire suppression in place, and it became a mixed hardwood stand. Now, the mixed hardwood stand, the pine stand, the mixed hardwood stand were all perfectly natural. Long-lived and stable, they lasted to the next catastrophic disturbance of 100 years. The pine stand could have lasted 200 years um, if given an opportunity. All very stable. So which one is natural? Well, they're all natural, and they're all very different. And we're not even getting into the climate things I was talking about yesterday. Okay, let's jump ahead and get into some of these disturbances now. This is Mount St. Helens. As I told you yesterday, I, I, I was around for Mount St. Helens, got ashed on. You know, Mount St. Helens erupted for about three years, and I got ashed on at least five times while working uh, in, the, in the forest. And, and the story that uh, Keith was talking about that, um, I don't know how many noticed, but uh, yesterday, actually started the night before yesterday, uh, the Calcoa volcano in southern Chile erupted very unexpectedly um, and then erupted again yesterday. And it's dumping ash on the, um, the village in Argentina of Elbasan, where I'm hoping to go in the next two weeks. So I, I may manage to get ashed on again. But here is, uh, I, I'm not going because of the hurricane, I was going to. Actually, I was going to study um, a mortality syndrome in their cedar trees that has nothing to do with volcanoes. This is Mount St. Helens right after the eruption. Uh, so this is Spirit Lake, and you can see that's filled with dead wood that got blown off the, the mountainside in the pyroclastic blast. Uh, and this is the blast zone here. And this all happened very, very suddenly. If you get down in there, this is what it looked like. Uh, in this particular part of the mountain, the ash was about a meter deep. Uh, up, you know, in other areas further north and further south, like in, in Seattle and so forth. And Seattle was about a half centimeter. Uh, and we know from the Mount St. Helens eruption 450 years ago, the ash in Seattle w was more like 10 centimeters. So from a Seattle standpoint, this was absolutely nothing 
Um, the 450 year ago eruption uh, dumped a lot more ash. And when you look in there, you know, there were ecologists, well known ecologists, who said, oh, we will never see a forest here again. Not necessarily true. Now, there was a couple of uh, different strategies. In the Volcanic National Monument, uh, part of it was left just for natural regeneration. It's actually doing amazingly well. But this down here is land that was replanted and reestablished by the Weyerhaeuser Company. So in this same view on the Weyerhaeuser land, this is 1980, 1997. So this was a very human thing. The other areas that weren't planted will look like this quite soon, but Weyerhaeuser sped it up. That was a sociological decision to do this. In terms of if we come back 100 years from now, and this isn't clear cut, then the stands will be, will be very similar. So this is what I'm getting. Your recovery plan depends on the lens that you're looking at it through. Now, this is a clear cut in uh, Loblawi Pine in southern United States. If you walk in, if this, it was logged during mud season. And if you, if, you log, if you walk in now, it looks like an absolute disaster. <laughs> this is the way they log many, many of their stands there. And I can tell you, in 18 years from now, uh, actually 18 years from this picture, it did actually happen. There, there was a, a merchantable, nice stand of Loblawi Pond that was harvested very similar like this uh, again. So things can look absolutely terrible. They can last for a while or they can be sped up by the recovery plan, but being sped up that you do that for sociological reasons. So what I want to do in, in the next few minutes is let's explore wind. Now I'm really glad after yesterday that I made this decision. I, when I first started putting this talk together, I've been starting to think about it for about three weeks, I was, I was going to show you a lot of pictures of mountain pine beetle. And then I, I thank goodness, had the stroke of thought saying, I don't need to show you folks pictures of mountain pine beetle. And the, one of the most important things I learned yesterday is how different the mountain pine beetle effect is in, in BC than it is in Alberta. All my pictures would have been from BC and you'd now be sitting for the next 10 minutes saying, he doesn't really know about, love, uh, about mountain pine beetle. And it's true, I don't know much about mountain pine beetle. So let's explore wind and then each of you can be thinking about what is going on in these pictures in your mountain pine beetle concept as we talk about some of the effects. Now wind is actually a more complicated term. That was the real reason why I made the shift is because wind affects uh, the site in, in so many different ways. And I know you're going to hate me for saying this, but it makes mountain pine beetle look relatively simple uh, in terms of, of recovery. Okay, here is um, a stand that had wind, and, and we were there about 48 hours later. Here's some of my students. This is in the Black Forest of Germany, uh, and this is a little group of two spruce trees. They weren't actually root grafted. The roots were intertwined, and they came down. And I want you to notice a couple of things. Look at all this dirt and, and forest floor uh, that's up here. I mean, that is totally characteristic of, of wind throw. So if we look at this picture, which is two red cedar trees, this is in the Stahegan Valley, um, right on the, uh, uh, the BC-Washington border. This is about three years after the wind throw. And you can see how the water is all washing down. Only a graduate student would agree to stand under those rocks while I took a picture. And, and you can see, so what is going to happen is we're getting a mound of dirt plus a depression, and that depression will stay moister, and you'll have a mound which will be relatively, you know, when we saw yesterday um, with the example uh, of the site preparation uh, going on in the boreal with the merry crusher and the mounding and, and the distancing, so I mean, that, that is just mimicking, uh, in a way, the effects of, of wind throw. Uh, that's going on and making those uh, variations in microsite. So this is what's happening there. So this is a, a dynamic system. Now, you don't necessarily have to get uprooting of trees. 
This is in uh, southern Alaska, just north of, of uh, Prince Rupert. And you can see here the, the trees snapped off. Now, trees can snap off for, for a, a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because of soil conditions. Sometimes it's a type of wind. Sometimes it is the structure of, of the wood. But this is a very, very different impact from the wind throw. Here, uh, anything in the forest floor is intact, and you're not getting that bare soil uh, being exposed. So I want to go back to the 1938 hurricane in Massachusetts. And here is a picture. And you can see in this picture, there was very little wind throw in this picture. When you wander around Connecticut and Massachusetts, there's a lot of wind throw. But it just depends on where you are. But the important thing in this picture is all this advanced regeneration down here. The next forest was already there and it was just being released. So nothing new came in, really, after the hurricane in 1938 in the, a vast amount of the area um, that, that is there. Now the 19, oh, wonderful name, it's called the 1921 Blow uh, in the state of Washington. This is out in the Olympic Peninsula, just south of Vancouver Island. And you can see here, we're getting breakage here, advanced regeneration in place. We, we, we get a wind throw mound here. So we're going to get a, a wet depression in here, and we're going to have above ground. So when you think about the different regeneration methods and the different, yesterday we talked about sensitivity of species to different sites. Different species have different advantages here. Now, one thing I'm going to touch on in a minute, but this picture is good to see it, and, and the next uh, two or three pictures as well, is the spatial pattern of the next stand is being totally set by the way this stand was destroyed. In other words, this wet area here was based on that tree there, and you can actually get a continuation of spatial patterns in mixed species stands if you have a recurring disturbance. Okay, this is 1985. I apologize for the, the quality. A, a student of mine went up on a Cessna uh, airplane shortly after the uh, tornado. Th this was a strange night in Pennsylvania. There were five major tornadoes on the Allegheny National Forest, and they weren't simultaneous. They happened over about a three-hour period. Now, you people in Edmonton are no strangers to tornadoes, uh, and you know how they go. Well, and this was one of the five, and in places, the width of, of destruction uh, was three kilometers. Um, and, and there's a, a, a strange, strange place, because the tornadoes weren't at the same time, where two tornado tracks cross each other, and in the middle, there's a 10-kilometer area uh, that burned down uh, because of the interaction of, of, of these tornadoes. This has been a wonderfully studied area. Here you can see another one of the five tornadoes. This came down um, o over this river. Now, this started taking on a, a social and financial impact where houses got destroyed, where it came down through uh, uh, the people living in the river. So this is what was in the news. Um, and this is what people focused on. If, if you're looking at it from a sociological lens, ecologically, these huge pathways uh, through, through the Allegheny National Forest uh, was what we looked at ecologically. Now, I want to zoom in a little bit on that. You can see the pattern. Of, of how the wind blew here. And you can see we have three very different zones here. Uh, we, I mean, we have a ha fairly hard edge. Here we have um, trees that snapped off. Here we have trees being uprooted. You can see the bare soil there, that light brown. Now we're back in this area. So here uh, we're seeing a huge advantage for seed species, particularly buried seed species. They have cherry here, which of course is a buried seed. The seed that come up from the cherry here is probably more than 100 years old, just like the cherry we have uh, out here. Here you're going to get a lot more advanced regeneration. So the whole new forest is based on what, how the disturbance impacted this. So you have this gene-environment interaction. You can't expect to do the same thing everywhere, even on a relatively small scale, because you're going to be fighting the biology. Now, that's OK. Often, for sociological reasons, we fight biology. With enough resources, we can usually do a half-decent job. If you don't want to spend resources, you go with the biology. 
And here we're really zooming in, and you can see some of the microsite uh, variation. So you, you have big level plans and then uh, with a lot of options, and you got to keep zooming in and, and be more and more specific. Now, when we consider disturbances, all disturbances, I mean, ecologically, this is what a disturbance is, it makes growing space available. And by growing space, I'm not just talking about physical space, we're using growing space to be the integration of all the growth factors, light, water, nutrients, and including physical space. But, you know, we focus a lot on light and water. Now, after partial disturbances, and in many places, pine beetle is a partial disturbance, the growing space is reoccupied by the residual vegetation that wasn't killed and the new regeneration. So you have the light water nutrients, who's going to get it? Well, the bigger you are, the easier it is to grab new resources. So the seedlings always are at a disadvantage. Advanced regeneration has an advantage over seedlings. Residual trees have an advantage. In fact, you know, when we're looking at, at competition in general, we often refer to it as the rich get richer. Now, in terms of self thinning, then we have the corollary, the rich get richer and the poor die. But that's exactly what's coming on, too, that if you have residual vegetation or anything that's bigger. So another thing we see in recovery after disturbance is getting there first is a huge advantage. It gives you an advantage over everybody else because you're bigger. Now, that doesn't mean you're best adapted. It just means you got there first. So one of the reasons why we plant is to get the trees we want there, there first, uh, as well as just speeding up the whole process. So I want to go back. Yesterday, I introduced a few of these slides, but I want to look at a little more detail. So I told you yesterday, these are three-dimensional dioramas made by an artist in, at the Harvard Forest uh, in Massachusetts based on one one particular part of the forest and the view. So pre-European settlement, it, they, they figured from the, from the ecologists who studied the area, the forest probably looked something like this. And then in 1740, we're talking about this year, you're getting subsistence farming, and the subsistence farming was occurring on the, the best and most accessible sites. Then, as the city of Boston, uh, 100 kilometers to the east, started being developed, a lot of food was needed, a lot of hay was needed, a lot of horses needed at the time. So we went from subsistence farming to feeding uh, Boston and giving it fuel, uh, which was basically hay for the horses. And we can see this large scale clearing. Now then we had the invention of the steel edged moldboard plow, which meant the prairies were a much better place uh, to grow uh, grains and hay uh, than Massachusetts, which is, because of the glaciers, incredibly rocky. So in 1850, the farmers started to leave. But again, the spatial pattern was interesting. They left the worst sites first, and they left the best sites last, because the people on the bad sites were ready to just pack up and go uh, there. So we started seeing um, the, the results of agricultural abandonment, but it was coming in patchwork and piecework, which is important because that means there was a distribution of seed sources uh, around kind of patchwork because distance to seed source can really affect um, what is happening during the recovery. Now this came up into a white pine stands mostly. White pine has a tremendous advantage in sod versus the hardwood trees, so you had a lot of white pine. White pine was a wonderful species for making boxes. We didn't have the craft process yet. So, you know, we, we have all the food in the prairies, we have all the machinery in the east. You had to get machinery to the farmers, you had to get food to the east, and it had to go in wooden boxes. And white pine is a wonderful, wonderful species for making wooden boxes. So the box industry developed. And, and it's, we started cutting down these white pine stands. And it looked like this, so you had scatterings and amounts of hardwood, advanced regeneration that had been coming in under the pine. It was a wonderful time to be a deer, deer were, which were pretty much non-existent at that time uh, in central Massachusetts, now just blossomed. They had all this food down low, browse, was very, it was very high nutrient. Uh, food, so the populations expanded very rapidly, and we started getting this sapling 
uh, type stands. And then the picture I showed you that, that I took in the year 2000 from very close to that area. And as I showed you, there's a stone wall uh, that indicate, you know, now, uh, and, and back in the 1900s and 2000, a huge deer browse problem because you had all those deer that were, I mean, the population was exploding when there was all that food. And now you can see it's in the stem exclusion stage, there's very little food, so it takes very few deer to eat all the seedlings there. You, uh, multiple states of equilibrium. Lots of food, lots of deer, no problem. Little food, little deer, no problem. No food, lots of deer. And this kind of thing we heard from, from Richard yesterday, problem. Sociological problem. Now, and what I'm talking about, recovery is faster with advanced regeneration or sprouting, and, and that's because they're there first. So different regeneration uh, methods are favored after different disturbance types. Now, I want to I, I give you a little sidelight, uh, uh, which I forgot to mention, on this agricultural period. It is estimated that before subsistence farming uh, began in Massachusetts, 95%, uh, and I, this is actually more for Connecticut, I'm from Connecticut, but 95% of Connecticut was forested. That at the peak of agriculture, 9% of Connecticut was forested. And in the year 2000, 56% of Connecticut was forested. So remember I was saying yesterday, the human impact around the world uh, is huge as we go. Okay, let's move to a, 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 an Alberta issue. Um, this is the actual uh, pit, well this is actually tailing area and pit. Um, I, uh, I do some research there. Um, and so this is all um, uh, reclaimed topography. Their engineers made this topography. Uh, they planted trees. And then this wetland um, developed naturally. This caught them by surprise. Now, now they're doing it in a very conscious way. And all these species uh, came in uh, naturally from the surrounding area. Um, and you can see the outside there. Where, where we're doing work, this is a jack pine stand. Uh, in this picture, it was 16 years old, uh, and, and we're looking at the recovery process. This was on a tailings area. Uh, they planted the jack pine. The contours were all made by engineers, totally manufactured environment, um, and we're looking at the jack pine. And one of the things that we were looking at was, you know, there's all this concern. It, is this natural? Is this working? Well, it's not natural. It's, it's a totally manufactured environment, but is it ecologically, sociologically acceptable. You know, there's always one more variable you can look at. So the, 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 our approach that we came in with, um, Groucho Marx, I remember Groucho Marx, you know, he had this line, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. He had the little duck that kept coming down. So any, anyway, our feeling was, let's look at the jack pine stand and let's perturb it. Let's put on some fertilizer. Let's do some thinning. Watch carefully the reaction of jack pine and compare it to jack pine stands on natural environments and see, you know, does it recover? Does it, it respond in the same way as a natural stand? Does it, does it walk like a duck? And, and we're in the middle of looking at that now. The question yesterday came up from Alan, I was thinking about uh, invasives, and I said I was going to mention today, but I'm going to be talking about plant species. Exotic invasives are a big problem, becoming a big problem everywhere in the world. Um, what you want to call an exotic invasive depends on your time frame, like we were talking about yesterday. Uh, we know from, from pollen records there was ginkgo in Vancouver. Would that be an exotic invasive now? I don't know. And this is that picture I was showing about. This is a two hectare fire uh, in Patagonia, Argentina, and virtually everything you see there is from BC. Uh, and that's because surrounding stands are all species brought from British Columbia, and now they're naturally invaded uh, this two hectare fire. So there was no planting, no artificial regeneration going on there. But BC trees grow much better and faster than neotropical trees do in Argentina and have a huge advantage. We don't know why that happens, uh, why the BC species grow so much faster in height um, than, than the Argentine species, uh, but it means, you know, in, in terms of competition, the, these trees are going to quickly shade the Argentine species. So this is 
the time all the growing space was available after the fire, and now we're seeing the invasion of all plant species. They could be native, they could be exotic, and they're going to keep invading until there's no more growing space available, and then they will increase in size. So societal time frame. Naturally, the stand initiation period I was just describing may last decades. I've studied some in, in some glacial valleys 30 or 40 years before the site is fully occupied. In the life of a tree, no problem. In the life of a site, could be a problem. And where we see this is erosion after large forest fires. You know, when you're walking in the bush, particularly in the coastal area, we see, the, you know, because the trees are so big, and you go down these deep gullies. Well, most of those deep gullies are the result of erosion in the first five or 10 years after big forest fires 100 years ago, 150 years ago. In the fires in the Kelowna area, already gullying has been a major problem. So in the site, a long stand initiation period might be a problem might not be a problem, depends on the other factors. In the life of a person, a 40-year stand initiation period, big problem. Because it means there's not going to be trees there for the rest of my life. And, and people respond very badly to that. This is the 2006 blow down on Stanley Park. Uh, this is the part that, you know, th this part of Stanley Park is referred to as the complete blowdown, but as you can see, it, it, it's not very complete at all. Uh, there's, there's a lot of partial. In terms of what I was showing yesterday about the resistance of the stand, uh, there, there's, there's blows in, in Stanley Park quite often, but what happened right on this face was that most of the hemlock actually was uh, infested with dwarf mistletoe, uh, mistletoe, which caused weak points in the stem. So in, it, there was only about 10 major gusts. In the first gust, all the hemlock close to the water snapped off. And then second gust, the wind came in further, snapped off more hemlock. The third and fourth gust, then the Douglas first started uprooting. And Steve Mitchell has studied this very intensively. He can recreate those 10 gusts uh, that came in and just caused this area to unravel. If, if we go to the other side of the park, uh, areas that were just small openings. Now here's a recovery plan. What you see in here, here these are the remnant trees. This is a small opening. It would look like group selection. And here, um, tree species were planted. You can see a lot of natural regeneration too. With the express purpose of this recovery plan to reduce hemlock in the stand, because the hemlock will get dwarf mistletoe. You can't avoid it. All those trees up there have dwarf mistletoe. <coughs> to make this forest more resistant to windstorms in the future, you need to reduce the amount of hemlock. And to do that, you have to put a hemlock at a severe disadvantage. So other species were planted uh, uh, quite tall, and they actually, in the park, uh, go in and brush it out each year. Um, and any hemlock they find, they're cutting, trying to put hemlock at a major disadvantage. Here's another area that's a little more open where the same thing has been done. So big leaf maple, Douglas fir, and red cedar were planted in groups. They were planted in groups to allow more biodiversity in between the groups rather than a uniform uh, spacing, and all hemlock is attempted to put uh, at a severe disadvantage. I, I was interviewed by CBC uh, at the time. This recovery plan was put together by the faculty and students of UBC. And I don't know if you were aware out here, but people all over Canada sent money to Stanley Park, one, two, three dollar donations, because the, this big uh, crown jewel of parks of, of Canada had all this destruction. And, and the reporter said, isn't, isn't this a waste of money? Did you need seven million dollars? Because we've heard you say that if you walked away, that Stanley Park would be a forest again. That's the natural vegetation of forest park, and I tried to explain, yeah, it would be a forest, but it would probably take 15 years to get it all reoccupied. And, and you can't tell 150,000 cruise boat people, come back in 15 years and there'll be a forest here. And, and you can't tell the people uh, of Vancouver, come back in 15 years, there'll be a forest here. It was a sociological decision to have rapid recovery. Stanley Park would recover very, very nicely, just a little more slowly. So, when we have these, these disturbances, there's always biological legacies, and when you're doing a recovery plan, you have to be aware of those. Overstory legacies, 
trees left over, remnant trees, and included snags. Understory legacies. Forest four legacies, including large woody debris. All these are going to be affecting um, the ecology of, of the stand and the site as you go on. And, and also topsoil. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a glacier, sin crude, or whether it's a windstorm, topsoil can be affected, and, and you have to worry about that legacy going into the future. Recovery. We have economic factors, volume, species, size. This is what jobs are all about. We care very much about those. Ecological structure, vertical structure, horizontal structure, biodiversity. And that is very, very much ecological. But if you look at these variables, and I try to kind of put them in rank, if you go down through this list, biodiversity, structural diversity, and so forth, down to wood quality, you can see it's just a gradient. You start very, very ecological, and then you end up very, very economic. Now, we could, we could have, I, I, I could have made this totally different. Instead of making it economic, I could have made it visuals, um, or I could have made it wildlife habitat. I could have put anything up, but you always have these gradients that are going. So depending on, you know, where you stand is where, where you stand is where you sit. You know, we always say that. So if you're worried about jobs, these are the first variables that come to mind. And, and if you're worried about wildlife, the, these are the variables that come to mind. If you're worried about tourism, it, you know, it's a little bit, you know, up in here. So what does this all mean? It all comes down to, as we go, that recovery is in the eye of the beholder. There is no right recovery.